President Aquino is attending the United Nations Climate Summit here in New York on Tuesday to highlight the risks that vulnerable countries like the Philippines face from climate change. Just days before the summit, the Philippines suffers from heavy rain and flooding from tropical storm Mario or Fong Wong. With 120 heads of state attending, Aquino and his counterparts only have all of four minutes each to address the event. To give you a more in-depth look at climate change and what's at stake for the Philippines, we talked to one of the most passionate voices in the global negotiations. Philippine Climate Change Commissioner Nader Ebieb Sanyo famously appealed for action to end what he called madness in Warsaw last year. This time, he tells me, he remains optimistic that change will come not just from high-level events here at the UN, but also from the grassroots. Here is our interview. What do we expect from this summit? Well, first, uh, I'd like to say that I don't have the illusion that a single conference or a single gathering can actually change the game with respect to what we need to do uh, to avert the climate crisis. Now, the summit, nonetheless, comes at a very crucial moment. It is uh, quite um, comfortably distant from the 2015 deadline, which will be in Paris at uh, end of 2015, but it also comes uh, near enough to establish that momentum towards Paris. We, we all know that the, that the legitimate venue for the climate negotiations uh, is under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which will culminate uh, in a way in 2015 for a new agreement. And that new agreement will capture everything that needs to enhance ambition and uh, urgent action so that we stay within the safe limits uh, with respect to the adverse impacts of climate change. And, and uh, the, the world has already decided that that uh, threshold is at a two degrees Celsius threshold. If uh, the, the agreement must maintain, must, must, must be within the context of meeting the two degrees target. And I would say that the New York summit being called by Ban Ki-moon on September 23 must also be coherent and consistent with meeting the two degrees target. What, what we're hearing in the news is uh, sort of the opposite of uh, positive indications. What we're hearing from the news from the biggest emitters, especially those who have historical responsibility, is that the 2015 agreement will not meet the two degrees target. This is, this, is, this is what has been said, and that is really worrying, especially from the perspective of the Philippines being one, if not the most vulnerable countries to climate change. Um, not failing to meet the two degrees target and failing even to come up with a robust agreement by next year, for, for me, is really condemning countries like the Philippines to, to a very dreadful future. Said that President Obama is the elephant in the room. Like, I want to ask, what do you mean? What do you mean by that in particular? We 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 of course try to solve the climate change problem within the purview of the multilateral system, where you have all countries around the world trying to solve it. In fact, the the, the climate convention is the most universal treaty with 195 parties to date. But the but the. The Climate Convention gave birth to another legally binding treaty, which was the Kyoto Protocol. The United States is the elephant in the room because uh, it, it, uh, it did not ratify the Kyoto Protocol, even if it represents more than 25% of the global warming pollution. Now, for us to avert the crisis, to once and for all be able to confront climate change head-on, we need the United States on board. And we need, uh, we need an agreement that takes, takes everyone into account because we cannot solve climate change if, uh, if we do not have all countries on board. Let's go to the Philippines um, because that was what President Aquino said that he was invited primarily to share the Philippine experience because we have a unique role in talking about climate change from our experience and he wants to call for action from the top emitter. So what exactly, what action do we want and what do we want to highlight from the Philippine experience? 
First, what, what we need to highlight from the Philippine experience is the moral voice that we bring into this whole debate. The Philippines uh, being at the receiving end of the climate change crisis, uh, uh, experiencing all of, all of its impacts and, uh, and uh, having to confront the devastating effects of climate change, we walk into that room and we bring in that moral voice. And I think that's what uh, the Secretary General wants the whole world to see. And the Philippines has been leading uh, the that leading in, in, in the international negotiations in bringing that moral voice into this discussion. With respect to what we need to see, science is very clear and uh, the scientific imperative tells us that we need to drastically transform the global economy so that we uh, meet the, meet, uh, prevent dangerous climate change from proceeding. That, that has been translated into specific figures. For instance, we need to reduce more than 40 percent below the 1990 levels by the year 2020, which is just six years away. We globally. also need globally, and we need a zero net emissions world by the year 2050. Meaning, uh, we we should have phased out the sources of carbon dioxide pollution by the year 2050, or at least we 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 have enough forest to absorb uh, or, or to sequester what we cannot eliminate. Philippines also announcing any new commitments or um, initiatives. I understand lately there was a new strategy announced by Malacanang for climate change. The important point that the Philippines must raise with respect to its commitments is what it is already seriously doing. For instance, we have a national renewable energy program which aims to triple the renewable energy capacity, but we also need to highlight the challenges we face in making that happen. Uh, but, but much of that will be done even without help from outside. And so the Philippines must take pride in, to be, in, in being one of the leaders in renewable energy in the world. We also, uh, we also look at uh, all of these commitments in the context of uh, a coming from actions from different sectors. For instance, we, we, we also want to transform our transport sector. We also want to ensure that... Uh, we are able to uh, sustainably manage our forests because, because forests and, and the way we use land has a lot of influence on the way uh, that uh, emissions are poured out into the atmosphere. So we, uh, we can announce these little things, uh, n noting for, for very importantly that the Philippines has had uh, very little to do in, in terms of contributing to this problem. Let's go to climate justice. This is really the theme that the Philippines highlights in the negotiations. And you said previously in an interview that the notion of sovereign states is problematic. Could you expound on that? Yes, climate change affects the whole world. Now, it has reached very dangerous levels. We now live in dangerous times with climate change being a constant threat and a grim reality. It is... Uh, it is a, a serious problem and it will take a very, very uh, gargantuan effort for the whole international community to avert it and to stop it. Now, what we, what we were talking about 20 years ago is how to, how to solve, stem this problem and nip it in the bud. But 20 years hence, now what we're talking about is how to uh, alleviate its effects and how to cushion its effects now because now we're assigned to the fact that climate change uh, has reached a point where it is, uh, it is uh, such a huge problem. So in that context and having said that, um, what, what, we, what we need to understand is um, the, the climate crisis will have uh, to, be, to be confronted in a way that all countries look at it uh, in, in, in a transformative manner. You talk about um, the principle of common but differentiated responsibility. Can you expound on that? Because that's, you said that's really one of the key features of the UNFCCC. The principle of common but differentiated responsibility, while it is at the heart of many international agreements, remains a, a very poorly understood concept especially Why? as it relates to climate change. Mm -hmm. now, climate change is also very clear. 
we will never be able to solve climate change if those who were responsible for the problem do not acknowledge that responsibility. And that's what we are seeing. So when we talk about common but differentiated responsibility, it means there is a common responsibility. In plain English, all of us, every individual, every country in this planet has a responsibility. But it is differentiated because those who were uh, largely responsible for the problem must have larger responsibility and that's where differentiation comes in and we also all know that uh, it is quite obvious that, that there are countries that have contributed more to this problem than others and as such the notion of that responsibility must be differentiated according to the sins that is uh, uh, that is proportionate uh, to, to, to what each country has done to exacerbate this problem. Mm -hmm. You say there's a sense of disappointment and other negotiators also say that like after every COP, what do you think is the biggest obstacle um, bogging down the talks? Like, what, why can't there be um, that much action that's clearly needed? Again, I go back to, to the notion that climate change is not a simple problem. It's a complex problem that was brought about by the kind of economic pursuit that the whole world tries to do. Now, in order for us to avert this crisis, it's really about reindustrializing the whole world in the same scale as the first industrial revolution. That's easier said than done. And that's why this is complex, and that's why you can hear many excuses. However, my optimism lies in the fact that I believe in humanity's ability to save itself and, and, to, and to rise above adversity. And so uh, I, I truly believe that the community of nations can find a solution to this. Why? Because the alternative is not even an, an alternative. It is, it is the demise of human civilization. It is the demise of, uh, of biodiversity. It is a dreadful future, especially for the poorest countries of the world and those who struggle even with basic issues such as poverty and, and food. So speaking of um, the poorer countries, at least in compared to the developed ones, like, let's go to our Philippine position going to the talks uh, in Lima and Peru because the uh, summit is really geared toward that as they said. It's not really the prime venue to negotiate. So going to Lima and Peru, what's the Philippine position and what specific outcomes are we going for this year and next year? The Lima conference uh, at the end of this year will be about formulating or uh, trying our best to come up with a draft text of the agreement for 2015. So when we say drafting, this means writing text, uh, looking at legal language, and also trying to sort out the what kind of legal instrument are we talking about. Mm -hmm. So this, these things remain unresolved until now, a few months before Lima. Until now. Until now. And what we need to see by Lima is a draft, is a concrete document that, that has words in it that uh, would probably have brackets pertaining to sentences or phrases that are not yet agreed. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is what we negotiate on. And we do not negotiate on concepts as we are doing right now. We need to negotiate on words and language that will go into the agreement. Because after all, the 2015 agreement will be a written treaty. It will be a written international agreement. And so before we get to that, we need to, to start writing the agreement. And the whole world must agree. To, the, to, to all the words that will be contained in this agreement. That's what we need to see in Paris. And from the perspective of the Philippines, we need to see an agreement that is ambitious, which again meets the two degrees Celsius target. We need to see a draft that incorporates equity and common but differentiated responsibility to ensure that those who are largely responsible for this problem do not escape from that responsibility. Number three, we need an agreement, or at least a draft in, in Lima, that, uh, that shows that uh, transformation of the world economy is, is, uh, is at the core of this agreement, and uh, which means that, number four, we need to see in that agreement a very robust aspect of, of climate finance, of, of how resources will be mobilized in order to avert this crisis. We're imagining that the whole world is fighting this war. And, like, and, and if we fight a war, we need to mobilize every resource that we have. We have to, we have to um, do pep talks for every country and, 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 and motivate every person on earth to be part 
of this endeavor to save the planet and to, in fact, save humanity. Okay, um, another event, um, a sideline event in the lead up to the summit is the People's Climate March. And I know that this is something that you're really supporting. And before, you mentioned that because of the climate stalemate, the change has to be driven um, bottom up, like from the people, grassroots initiatives. So this being one of those kinds of initiatives, like, what do you think, um, what, what are we trying now to send a message to world leaders, like with the march and similar events around the world? The People's Climate March is a culmination of the world's desire. to pursue a more sustainable world, of the world's desire to avert perhaps one of the most serious problems that humanity has ever faced. It's also a culmination of frustration over the years. And what the People's Climate March, I think, is anticipated to be able to do is to highlight that frustration. We know that marches happen here and there and, and happen everywhere almost but it is part of a growing social, global, social movement. And I think it's strengthening. I even sense a planetary awakening where grassroots communities are now waking up to this problem and responding to the call for urgency. I've always maintained that the climate crisis will be won or lost at the grassroots level. Because in fact, the world is made up of people and it will depend on real people to solve this problem. I'm, 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 we're talking about individuals, we're talking about homes, organizations, local communities, local businesses. All of this, if they work together and join that global movement to avert climate change, it can happen. And we even, we even, we even think that that uh, is more important than an international agreement. Although an international agreement, of course, is, is crucial because it is a signal from governments. Um, last, you've been called um, the unlikely climate justice star. I wanted to ask you why climate change has become such a personal issue for you. For me, the, the motivation is quite simple. Mm -hmm. Climate change has become a very serious threat to humanity. In fact, a very serious threat even to our generation. And it is our duty to hand down a planet to our children that thrives, that is good for them. And for me, it's quite simple. I'd like to be able to wake up in the morning and look my children in the eye and tell them, I've done my best to leave you a better world. And that's our interview with climate change negotiator Yev Sanyo. Join us here on Ravler as we cover the biggest climate gathering and the largest demonstration to demand climate action in New York called the People's Climate March. I am Makaraig, Rappler, United Nations.